Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Tuesday Talk. I'm Melissa with Sparrow Living and I'm so excited to introduce this week's um, presenter, Randall Ford. Randall is an acclaimed photographer and author with his works appearing in publications such as Texas Monthly, L.L. Bean, um, and advertisements all over the nation. He also has two books published, The Animal Kingdom and most recently, Good Dog. So Randall be will be walking us through his career, talking about um, his process, showing us some of his favorite pieces. And at the end, we will be raffling off um, the Animal Kingdom book. So if you would like to be entered to win one of these books, we just need your name in the comments. And if you're a resident of one of our properties, if you can just let us know, that would be great. And without further ado, here's Randall. Hi guys, it is great to be here. Um, Melissa, I appreciate the, the kind introduction and I'm excited to, to talk to you guys. Um, I, when people ask me um, what kind of photographer I am, I, I normally say that I'm a, I'm a commercial and advertising photographer that specializes in lifestyle and portraiture photography. And that's quite a, quite a mouthful. So uh, I, I wanna kind of walk you through what that is and also kind of walk you through kind of a newer, uh, my business in the world of fine art. So um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and during high school, I took a black and white photography class, and I, I really enjoyed the photography as, aspect. Um, one aspect that I really enjoyed about it was just photographing friends and going through the whole learning process of photography. But what I didn't enjoy was, um, was the darkroom aspect. And most, most uh, photographers loved the darkroom. It was kind of this cathartic uh, space where they could really take their time and, and have fun with it. Uh, for me, I guess I was just a little too patient, uh, impatient to, to work in the darkroom. And so what I ended up doing, I ended up scanning my photography into Photoshop and in the so that was one of the earliest generations of Photoshop that I uh, that I kind of grew up on. And and I would say that I'm a photographer that grew up on digital photography. Um, that probably one of the first generations of photographer that grew up um, on digital. So um, after high school, I went to Texas A and M. Um, and I got a business degree from Texas A&M, but during that time, um, I shot for the school newspaper. Uh, in fact, I should, I should mention this in case mom is listening, but mom encouraged me to get involved in an extracurricular activity outside of, of the normal college activities. So I got involved with the school newspaper and then I really started to get into photography and we were shooting every day. Um, I initially shot film and then I started shooting digital pretty quickly, which would have been in 2000, late 2002 to early 2003. And that was when photojournalists were just starting to move from digital to, uh, to film. So um, while I was, I'm gonna fast forward here to the next slide. While I was in college, I, I had the amazing experience to go over to Italy and spend the summer abroad um, learning about the art and the culture and it's that I fell further in love with photography and it was just a, a wonderful experience. This is one image that that is still stuck with me um, over the course of the last 15 to 20 years and um, I was I remember I was photographing these you know, the beautiful architecture in St. Peter's and I was just thinking like God, wouldn't it be great if something or somebody walked in and added some more context to this shot. And, and right then, the, the, almost like with a hallelujah in the background, this group of nuns walked in and they started walking towards us. And um, I sort of kind of inched over to the side and kind of let them go ahead. And then I crept right behind them and I, I, I snapped a couple shots here. But this was one of my more stealthy uh, pictures from back in the day. So, but, 
Um, one of the things that ended up happening when I was at a and and when I was graduating is that I went from enjoying uh, making a, I'm sorry, I went from enjoying capturing an image to making an image. And this idea of making an image has stuck with me throughout my career. Um, I'm going to touch more on that, but um, when I talk about conceptual portraiture, that means kind of an image that I kind of um, created and conceptualized um, by working with talent, by working with, uh, um, uh, when I say talent, I mean models, by working with wardrobe stylists and all this different crew involved, almost um, how a director would work, um, uh, you know, on a commercial or a movie. So I, I went from this, you know, photojournalism background to more of a, uh, um, a creative, uh, uh, sort of a creative look into advertising photography and really fell in love with that aspect of it. So um, I graduated from a and uh, I, I moved to Austin. I worked for a photographer in Austin. Um, that's kind of typically how it goes. You assist a photographer and then you uh, kind of go out on your own. So um, I, I at some point I went out on my own and one of my goals was to shoot, in addition to become an advertising photographer, one of my goals was to shoot covers for Texas Monthly. And after hounding them long enough, I was able to, they, they hired me to start shooting covers. And I'm going to just flip through a few of my favorite covers here and talk about them. Uh, this was the 40 best small town cafes. In, in particular, they had me photograph um, this, this, Dorothy's in uh, Steamville that is known for the best chicken fried steak uh, in Texas and this was inspired by Norman Rockwell just the overall feel and style and aesthetics um, another one that was really heavily inspired by Norman Rockwell was this shot this kind of road trip sh um, shot uh, for Texas Monthly and if you remember this was um, Norman Rockwell had this famous picture uh, or painting of a road trip, of a family on a road trip. They're, excuse me, they're going out on the road trip and they're all excited and happy and then they're coming back and everyone's exhausted and ready to be home. So this was the going out, the getaway shot, well, the getaway while you can shot. And we had a blast making this. And this was <clears throat> at a time in my career where I composited a lot of stuff together um, using Photoshop. When I say composited, I meant, I mean, I shot a lot of these elements separately. So I shot the kids in the back separately. I shot the dog separately. I had a picture of the dad and a picture of the mom that I shot separately. And <clears throat> I actually shot the car in a parking lot in Austin and then we photoshopped the background in. So it was kind of this um, uh, huge kind of composite and in a sense a digital illustration. Um, and, and that's something that was part of my early career, but I've sort of transitioned away from that um, into my current career. Um, while I don't shoot a lot of food photography, I did have the awesome privilege to photograph the best burgers for Texas Monthly. And this was, um, this was in, I believe this was in Alamo Springs, which is right outside of Fredericksburg. And uh, when we shoot food photography, <clears throat> We always work with what's called a food stylist. And the food stylist is, they're basically like getting every little thing on this burger just right. So they're placing the tomato, the avocado, they're melting the cheese just right. They're putting the flip of the lettuce up just right. They're getting that little drip of sauce just right. And a lot of times in order, before we do that, before we work with the food stylist, the chef, brings out his best version of, in this case, the burger. So we could kind of get a sense of well, what does this look like? So the chef, <clears throat> the chef brought out this burger um, and it no doubt tasted good, but it was not as photogenic as we would have liked. And here is an example of what this burger looked like beforehand and what it looked like after food styling. So whenever you see food photography, whether it's a Whataburger or uh, any other restaurant, you're gonna, there's going to be some food styling involved because a lot of times it looks like this, even though it tastes like that. Um, we even got a few flies on there captured in that shot. So 
<clears throat> cover Texas and what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to photograph uh, kids for this issue called How to Raise a Texan. And the idea is that we photograph a bunch of kids in diapers and boots. And it was a great, you know, it was a blast of a, uh, of a shoot to bring to life, but it was also a huge, huge challenge. Um, and what we ended up doing, and I'm going to show you guys in this video here in a second, what we ended up doing was we ended up having to composite, which is piece together, going back to that word composite, piece together these images in order to kind of get this lineup of all of these kids together uh, and get these great expressions. Um, I will have to shamelessly, shamelessly admit this uh, is my daughter's uh, first appearance in a magazine cover. She is uh, top row, second from the left. So shout out to her. Um, and then here's a video here. I'm going to knock the sound off when it pops up back on. So you'll see this is kind of an example of these studio environments that, that I work with. Um, and they present themselves well in a sense that it allows me to control the environment. But at the same time, it's a, it's a pretty artificial environment. And <clears throat> When you're working with kids in an environment like this, it's very important to have kind of a team working with you. So um, we had moms there. We had baby room helping us get them all in the right spot. But this was this cover was a was a was a big challenge to bring to life. In contrast, um, I've done some ads for Huggies, and when we do ads for Huggies, it's much more buttoned up, so to speak. We've got three or four backups for each kid. And it's not as kind of chaotic as what this looks like here. Uh, but for magazine work, this is kind of one of those things that it, it is what it is. And we were just kind of trying to bring it to life as, uh, as smoothly as possible as you could with a bunch of toddlers wearing diapers and, and cowboy boots. So working with kids definitely requires a certain amount of energy, especially the day of the shoot. And here's an example of us compositing these together in different pieces. So in a lot of my work, I, I, I work with, obviously I work with Photoshop. I do work with retouchers that help um, kind of handle this part of the compositing. So, uh, a huge honor in my career was uh, creating a cover for Time Magazine. And they came to me and they wanted me to, to uh, shoot this story uh, about uh, people just choosing to not have kids as often. Low, I guess at the time, and um, people just choosing to not have kids. So um, while I photographically might have been a good choice, um, from a life perspective, I probably wasn't because uh, I have I have a, a large family, happily, I have a large family of my own. And this was a shot on the inside, the opener is what we call this. And uh, on the right side was how, was me kind of, I'm mean, sorry, on the left side was me before kids. And then on the right side was me after kids. So uh, I, I'd be the one right now pulling the big, uh, uh, the big beach cart with a bunch of toys for all, all three of my kiddos. So this was a project that I did for uh, to commemorate uh, L.L. Bean's 100th year anniversary. And what they did was they commissioned me to, uh, to basically photographically recreate covers that they had painted in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this was such an exciting assignment to do because I'd already done some of the Norman Rockwell inspired work. And so this was kind of an extension of that. In a sense, though, it was very challenging because painters can 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 paint what they see in their mind, not just what they see um, with their eyes. And so, photographically, it doesn't quite work that simple. That simply. So, what I ended up having to do was I ended, ended up having to shoot a bunch of parts separately. So, like we shot this this car on offs with all the people, and then. We shot separately. We went up to this top of this uh, like uh, overlook, and we shot the lake. And then I shot the sky separately. So we do all these things to sort of bring uh, uh, an image like this to life that um, hopefully looks as realistic as possible. This was another one that I did for Elo Bean that 
was a little bit simpler from um, a production standpoint, but there was one kind of, there was one kind of snag and the uh, LOB brought us this fresh trout for us to, for the boy to be holding. And uh, the only problem was that the trout, three, three large trout was pretty heavy for the boy to hold. So we actually had to shoot the trout separately and then Photoshop the trout in. So the boy's holding the trout and we're shooting the trout separately and then Photoshopping it all together. The other cool thing about this is that a lot of the wardrobe in these was pulled from L.L. Bean archives from that era. So like the overalls and the jacket and the waders he was wearing were, were actually from uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, that, that kind of era of L.L. Bean. So early in my career, <clears throat> I was commissioned by uh, Roy Spence, who was one of the founders of GSDNM Advertising in Austin, me to take a bunch of this book called The Amazing Faith of Texas. And this book was um, uh, a book highlighting uh, churches and, well, churches, synagogues, different places of worship and faith all over Texas. And so they sent me all over Texas to photograph not only these these different churches, um, and a lot of them were these small, tiny churches in small towns that were a blast to photograph, but they also sent me to photograph people from different walks of, of, of faith. And this one in particular was a pastor living in Marathon uh, out in West Texas. And uh, when I was photographing him, he, he initially had this really clean cowboy hat on, and it, it looked it looked pretty cool. But I saw this hat hanging on the wall and I looked at him, I said, hey, can we use this hat? And uh, he kind of paused and thought for a sec. And he was like, if we use that hat, my wife is just gonna kill me. I was like, well, let's try it because it could be pretty cool. So I don't know if he's, if he's in trouble years later for wearing that cowboy hat, but I sure did think it brought some character to the shot. This is an ad that I did for Frost Bank. And, um, the idea is is uh, that Frost Bank is kind of they're always they're always with you. Was promoting their mobile app and shot at the iconic Fort, Fort Worth stockyards. And um, this was just one of those moments where the light was pouring in. It was the light was just perfect. The cowboy had this kind of regal uh, look on his on his face, and it just felt kind of just just right. So. I'm going to pause for just one second. Uh, Melissa, <clears throat> my internet connection is saying that I'm unstable. So I'm going to pause and I'm going to quickly hop over to another internet connection. Excuse me for one second. The, this is the, the joys of, of Zoom. All right, should be back in business. And here we are, okay. <clears throat> so this, I'm just making sure that I'm up and running now. All right, so this is for uh, this company called JDate, which is a Jewish dating service, similar to Christian Mingle or something like that. And the idea uh, with these concepts is that we have these Jewish grandmas that are they're matchmaking people, they're match match matchmaking folks during the day. And then at night they're coding all the, the they're coding all the, the code for the website. And so we actually work with it. I shot these in Brooklyn. Um, and we actually worked with a casting director up there who cast actual Jewish grandmas from communities in the uh, kind of New York tri-state area. So this was a blast um, to bring to life and, and, a, and a really kind of a, a humorous campaign. So. Um, she knows JavaScript, Python, so, so JavaScript and Python are both code, and then Shirley Finkel, Finkelstein's grandson, of course. Uh, another really fun ad that I did over the court, over the last couple of years was this ad for CenturyLink TV, and it was called Couch Chameleons. And the idea here is that these, these folks are sitting on their couch and they're enjoying their TV so much they're just blending into their couch. And in order to bring this to life, what we did was we custom upholstered uh, sofa, and then we also custom upholstered sofas, and then we also created custom wardrobe to match the sofa with the with the same material. 
So we had to find this material that was not only strong enough for the upholstery, but also strong enough, or sorry, um, soft or supple enough to create wardrobe out of. And so each one kind of had their, their theme. This was kind of a, a kind of a 70s style. This was a more kind of a little bit glamorous Iris Apfel style. And then this was kind of our mid-century modern style. So <clears throat> this, uh, an aspect of my, of my business uh, being an advertising photographer is working with pharmaceutical advertising companies. And this was a shoot for a pharmaceutical advertising company that um, sells a drug that treats migraines. And in, in order to, um, they, they, they basically wanted to show that how painful migraines are while also kind of it being blatantly obvious that what they're selling is my, for migraines. So what we did was we worked with a special effects makeup artist to, I'm gonna zoom in here, a special effects makeup artist to basically create this word migraine that in a way where it looked like it was etched in this guy's forehead. And she did this with a, uh, a few different types of materials and then applied this uh, skinned adhesive and sheen to it. So it really looked like it had this depth to it. But this is a great example of a lot of my shoots. I work with a big team and <clears throat> It's a collaboration and certainly is, is, is uh, dependent on me working with, with really uh, high quality and talented individuals. And this is just a great example of that. So <clears throat> this was, uh, this portrait of a dairy cow was shot almost, it was shot over 10 years ago, but it was the first animal that I photographed. And now I've, up to this point, I've photographed hundreds of different uh, animals and I, it was it was kind of ironic or a little a little odd that I, the first animal I photographed was a dairy cow um, but this design company wanted me to photograph dairy cows um, for this uh, for a redesign of a magazine they were they were working on and the idea was to give some personality to the cows and just kind of um, showcase their soul so to speak um, and and that's a, that's in essence <clears throat> what my animal portraiture sort of grew into is this idea of photographing an animal in a humanistic way where we see them as a person and not necessarily as an animal. Um, after I did this portrait of dairy cows, um, I was commissioned to photograph other animals. Uh, this one in particular for Verizon was showcasing their different sizes for plans that they were offering at the time. Um, and they wanted to photograph uh, cats all the way from a domestic kitten to a lion. And so we photographed each cat separately, as you can imagine. It could have been a, a little challenging to photograph a lion with a kitten, but we photographed them separately. And I just conceptually, this was a, a really fun uh, ad to bring to life and, and was kind of the start of this animal world that I was venturing in, into. So uh, this was an ad for, this is a pharmaceutical ad for a company called, uh, or for a drug called Spiriva. I believe it treats COPD. And um, the elephant was like the mascot for this drug. And, and this, um, this shot in particular was interesting because we photographed, we built this garage set actually in New York. And then I had to go to LA to photograph the elephant because the elephant was out there New York typically doesn't have um, uh, the amount of animals that, that Los Angeles does. Los Angeles is, uh, in, in addition to Texas, I, I will photograph a lot of my animals in LA or California. This was an ad for, your, for Purina Mills. Um, and the idea is, is simple. It was that animals speak louder than words and that all we gotta do is show you a picture of our animal and you'll see how healthy they are. And then here's a kind of a behind the scenes video kind of showing the, the, the process of this. <clears throat> and <clears throat> for this, we were shooting video as well. So it was an, it was an even larger set. So we're walking these cows and pigs and horses and chickens uh, into the studio and we've got all these lights and 
we're creating these portraits, uh, both moving and still pictures of these great looking farm animals. <clears throat> the pig was the most challenging out of this bunch because uh, the, the, the pigs, they naturally, they wanna have their, their head down and creating portraits of an animal, you want their head up. And so what we did for the pig uh, was we, we sprayed a little water and he kept lifting, lifting his snout to kind of try to catch some of the water. So with a lot of these animal portraits, we're always kind of working through different kind of tricks and techniques to, to get the best shot. <clears throat> There's our pig. This one cow, I should, I should mention this one cow, that one really great, great looking cow or heifer uh, you saw at the end uh, was cut loose in the studio. And so we had this cow waltzing around the studio um, for a time during that shoot. It was a, it was a little bit uh, nerve wracking. So as I, as I have <clears throat> up to this point or up to that point, I had been um, photographing animals mostly for advertisements. But then I, I got a, I started getting requests of people wanting to um, purchase photographs of mine and sell them, I'm sorry, purchase photographs of mine for their walls. And so essentially, I started pursuing this alternate path where I was selling my work um, as, as art um, that someone could frame and put on their walls. So I created this collection of animal portraits, which ended up being my, my first <clears throat> solo book, The Animal Kingdom. And sort of as I mentioned earlier with the cows, I really aim to showcase each animal's personality and their soul. And um, for all of these, I, I, I want these images to connect with the audience. I, I want them to look and just feel something, whether it's humor or sadness or um, something else, I want them to feel something. And so it's, it's all um, it's just me trying to capture something interesting of these animals in a very isolated, um, uh, or let me rephrase that, in a very simplistic background on either white or black. And um, here's a shot of this chimpanzee kind of that was framed up that I, I, I've, I've learned that in order for someone to visualize art, um, especially photography on their walls, they've kind of they have kind of have to see pictures of the work framed, and so that has helped from a uh, just from a marketing perspective. That's helped me to showcase potential clients what this work looks like in an environment. So sometimes the work is serious, and sometimes it's humorous. Um, this was inspired by the by the uh, famous Burt Reynolds picture in the nineteen issue nineteen seventy two issue of Cosmopolitan. Uh, just like the dichotomy of human emotion, I can't, I kind of aim to capture a similar range of emotions in my animal portraits. Like I said, my intention is for these portraits to speak to you. And I really think, um, after, after, after sitting on these for a few years and, and really contemplating, I feel like what they say to you, what they, what they speak to you, so to speak, um, that depends on, on your feelings because i've noticed some people may look at this portrait and may say that she looks fierce while others may say she looks sad and i think the emotions we apply to these portraits are emotions that are present within us so this this was kind of my grizzly bear that was uh inspired by the mona lisa uh the 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 train i mentioned earlier i work with with trainers and especially with the more predatorial animals. I, I typically have two to three trainers that I'm working with in the studio. And the trainer looked at me when I was photographing this, this grizzly and he could tell I was a little nervous. And he said, Randall, don't worry, he won't hurt you. He might knock you down, but he won't hurt you. And I just like, just about fainted when he said that. But um, I, I, I made it out unscathed. And that day I also photographed uh, Felix the lion. This was a day where I photographed lions, tigers, and bears. So it was the Wizard of Oz, uh, the Wizard of Oz trifecta. And here's a, a fun kind of behind the scenes clip. So 
the Bengal tiger, if you saw there, the, oh, wouldn't that be great to hug a lion? The Bengal tiger uh, and the lion, they're trained to walk to a mark. So the Bengal was, and this was his snarl, which scared me a little bit. <laughs> the Bengal, I want to just go back just real quick. The, the Bengal, if you see that right here in the, on the screen, he's, he's trained to walk to a mark. And once he hits that mark, the trainers pay him, so to speak, with a piece of raw chicken or beef. So this is a, um, this was not on that same day. Um, the trainers that I was working with on this day, they were feeding uh, Dexter, his name is Dexter, um, this mountain lion. They were feeding him raw chicken on a stick. And um, like any cats, domestic or wild, they use their hands to swipe at stuff. And Dexter swiped at this piece of raw chicken and it landed, instead of in his mouth, it landed down at my feet. And he jumped off this riser he was on and he came down to eat this chicken at my raw feet. I had a trainer next to me, but still the, the, the fear inside of me was, was suffocating. I knew though, do not move. And I took a huge deep breath as the trainer gently walked Dexter back up on the riser and I was just fine. But after that, I was like, okay, I need a break from, from these big cats as beautiful as they are. Here's a more regal pose of Dexter that didn't have me so, uh, so worked up. <laughs> so this is Jabari, which uh, um, it, Jabari means brave. And Jabari was, he was only one year old at the time. And people ask me, did I shave his head and, and give him this mohawk? And, and no, absolutely not. Um, this is his mane growing in. And so it's kind of like teenage, uh, a teenage lion where he's got this kind of messy mane that's growing in. But I just thought it was such a unique um, feature to highlight in a portrait. And I, I photographed him for quite, a, for a good 10 to 15 uh, minutes, which can sometimes be a long time with, with a, a lion, if you can imagine. Um, and I only got maybe one or two frames, and this was one of them that I really, really liked and really wanted to get that eye connection with the camera. So when I told folks that I was photographing a sloth, they said, oh, that'll be easy because they don't, they don't move much. And um, that was not the case, actually. It was quite difficult. What we did, what we had to end up, what we had to do, we had to basically build in the studio with a couple stands and a big branch, something that he could hang on like his natural environment. And once we did that, he was fine. However, he kept spinning around in circles um, away from me, which made it very challenging for me to get the right picture. Because when I'm in studio, I'm using lighting typically from the front in order to create this kind of soft portrait style. And uh, Perry, Perry the Sloth, he just kept rotating away from me, which made it very difficult. But uh, I, I finally captured this one shot of him looking at me. So this is Alejandra the flamingo and Amelia the pink cockatoo. And um, birds have brought so much color into this series, um, color and detail uh, that is just fascinating. You know, I talk in my book a little bit about Mother Nature um, and what what I believe to be a divine hand in all of this. And it really is just beautiful to see uh, the, the, the color and the detail uh, in a lot of these birds. And then this is another example of me showing the work uh, in an environment so a potential customer could kind of uh, understand what it looks like in the environment. So this was um, an African crane, which just has this gorgeous, uh, uh, almost like headdress, um, and it, it made a great shot for this client uh, to have in their home. So I kind of going back to cows, there's something about cows, I think, because of my early days in portraiture, that dairy cow that I first mentioned and first photographed. But this is Eleanor, and um, Eleanor is the perfect example that imperfect can be oh so perfect. Um, you know, these cows, they're a common theme in my portraiture, and I think it's interesting because you don't see you don't see cows heroicized or glamour glamour glamorized. So showing them showing them under this beauty light, I think it's really interesting, and it's something that that it hasn't been done 
really uh, that hasn't been done before. But the Highland cows are are some of my favorites. This is Gertrude, um, who's got this uh, these these blonde locks just covering her eyes. And the names you'll notice I, I'm I'm referring to these animals as names. That's part of my process um, uh, in 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 you know showcasing my fine art is making sure that their name is known because I I think it helps us personify them and uh, understand them in a sense. So this is uh, Eloise, um, an elephant. It was just a wonderful experience photographing Eloise. I was actually able to, most of the animals I work with, I, I'm not able to, to touch. Like a, like a lion, I can't just go pet a lion or hug a lion like the trainer was doing in that video earlier. But I was able to put my hand on Eloise's uh, shoulder and I could feel the rise and the fall of her breath and I could feel her heartbeat. Or her heartbeat. And to feel an elephant's heartbeat, heartbeat was a pretty special moment. Um, and then I went in and I got this very detailed shot showing all the wrinkles. It almost looks like this overhead geographic map um, until you really sit with it and you see that, that big elephant eye. So here's another video, um, behind the scenes video of when I was photographing an elephant. Um, this is actually another elephant. This is an Asian elephant. And <clears throat> these elephants are actually based out of Fredericksburg. So if anybody um, wants to go meet them, uh, they can make the trip down to Fredericksburg. And it was amazing photographing this elephant. So this turned out to be a, a, a very important image in my work. Um, this uh, black swan, I really wanted to include it in the Animal Kingdom, which was published two years ago. And a black swan is an unpredictable event. It's one with widespread and unexpected ramifications. It was given this name in a time when black feathered, when, when this black feathered bird was thought to only exist in stories. Its discovery in the real world uh, was a surprise to all. And the importance of that is that it's safe to say that we're currently in the midst of this black swan, of a black swan event. Uh, COVID-19 is something that came out of nowhere and most people did not see coming and has dramatically changed the course of, of history and certainly um, dramatically shifted uh, what has happened this year. Um, so uh, this was just, I was so glad that I, that I captured this image and I, I, I wanted to share it with you guys. And here's another shot of the, uh, an interior designer that used this image in, uh, in this breakfast room. So I, I sometimes find that even the most, uh, potentially the most normal animals that are around, uh, that are all over the place can sometimes be very, very interesting. Uh, this is an Iyam Samani chicken, which is all black. His cone, his beak, his feathers, and even the meat has this dark gray color to it. Um, and I actually first saw these on Google and I didn't think it was real. And when I found that it was real, I, I knew that I had to find one and, and photograph. So I found someone in East Texas that had these and I traveled to them and photographed uh, this portrait. But this was part of uh, this black collection that I have that it's a series of portrayals of all black animals on black backgrounds. And it's, it's, it's me kind of exploring the different tonalities that you can see with just these black tones on this black background. So this is uh, Geronimo, the lone wolf. And um, there was something so striking about the yellow eyes. And then this is Murphy or Murph as he went by to his trainers. Um, Murphy had this like subtle growl kind of the whole time during our shoot. And um, I was told that that's his work mode, which uh, didn't really make me feel better, but uh, nonetheless, we, were, we, were, we, we made it through. And, the spots and the green eyes really were something that um, was very interesting to, to me and I hope, hope to you guys. I, you know, I, again, kind of going back to some of these mundane animals, I thought it would be so cool to photograph a black, I mean, a photograph a skunk on a black background where you just saw the S shape of his, uh, of his white stripe. And uh, 
sure enough, I found somebody um, in North Texas that had a pet skunk they had uh, nursed back to life and removed its uh, its scent glands. So I I I came away from that um, unscathed without having to take a tomato bath to get rid of a, a skunk scent. One of the things in a lot of my animal portraits is just being ready for the moment. And this horse just went down to groom herself and uh, I just, I was ready and I just kind of squatted down with her and captured this shot. It's one of my favorites. So horses uh, presented quite a challenge actually to me uh, initially because from a photographic perspective, they've got this long blocky head and that, that, that is kind of challenging because uh, it's so large as well. And so I figured out that I had to use, you know, lighting that was kind of particular. Uh, I had to use focal lengths or lenses that kind of compressed the portrait instead of elongated it. Because the last thing I wanted to do was elongate the portrait uh, the, or kind of the head of this horse. And so um, the other thing that was interesting, by the way, this is um, Black Betty. She's a champion quarter horse and her, her mane is braided here. Um, but one of the things that I found interesting is that different types of horses are expected to do different types of uh, poses for photography. So for example, quarter horse owners, they want the quarter horse's head to be a little bit lower and they want their eyes to have this soft gaze. In contrast, an Arabian horse owner, and there may be some horse experts that are listening in that are telling me that I'm, I'm full of it, but I, I, think I'm, I think I'm on the right track here. Um, an Arabian horse, uh, audience is okay with the horse looking a little more startled and a little more upright, uh, where its eyes are a little bit more uh, um, uh, startled looking or a little bit more uh, alive, so to speak. Um, and then I also used uh, a, a fan to kind of blow the hair uh, on this beautiful Arabian horse. This is Poppy and owls are one of the most ex expressive uh, creatures that I photographed uh, for this collection. And I just love the white, the black and white, and then you got this pop of yellow like right in the middle. And then also when I'm photographing these animals, I look for different angles, different, um, uh, just different perspectives. And this was one that I thought would be so cool to capture. So um, I basically, the trainer was basically, um, the owl was resting on the trainer's forearm and the trainer was just standing below the owl and kind of held the owl up. And then the owl kind of naturally like lifted its wings like it was about to, to, to lift off. And that's when I captured the shot. So this is Cairo, um, a spotted leopard. And Cairo, um, the, the Cairo's trainer and owner told me I photographed him in, in LA and his owner told me, you know, this was actually for the Verizon ad I showed you guys earlier. His owner told me, he said, uh, Cairo has a great snarl uh, if you want to photograph it. And I said, absolutely. But he said, once we start the snarl, he's, he's going to want to keep doing it the whole shoot. So if we start it, we got to kind of do that at the end of the shoot because he's going to want to do that all day. Um, so here's a picture, a video of Cairo with his trainer uh paying him uh chunks of raw meat while he's snarling and uh his trainer uh, had such uh, a level of love and respect for him and you can i think you can see that in this video it's pretty neat okay there we go so he's going he's saying the word speak 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 And those are big hunks of, big hunks of sirloin. And then earlier I talked about a change in perspective, this cheetah that I photographed, just a, a shot from, from the back uh, was an interesting shift in perspective and design uh, in the book. Um, this is actually Johan uh, that lives in this uh, sanctuary for big cats um, in fr uh, outside of Fresno, Cal California. Uh, near the Sierra Mountains. And um, 
portions of my book, The Animal Kingdom, a portion of the proceeds from my book, The Animal Kingdom, um, go to benefit the amazing uh, Cat Haven, is what this place is called. And another shift in perspective showed me that photographing this longhorn, his horns would actually cover up his eyes. And I thought that was just so cool and something that was really unique. He had these real, real curvy horns. Uh, this was one of my longhorns that uh, resides at the Fort Worth Stockyards. And here's another behind the scenes video. This is actually a, um, a Gibbons ape that kept wanting to give me a hug, which is pretty, a pretty neat experience. So he kept jumping in my, jumping in my lap. Capuchin was yelling at me. And then I even found a squirrel and there's our skunk that I talked about. And I had to photograph an armadillo. That's our, that's our sloth I was talking about. I mean, it's not every, every day that I bring a, that we bring a buffalo into a, a studio or a makeshift studio in this case. So here's Merle the squirrel. And Merle, uh, um, he's eating an unsalted pistachio right here, which ended up being the perfect treat for him to stay put for half a second so we could capture a, a portrait. Like I mentioned earlier, being a Texan, I had to photograph an armadillo. And uh, so this is Quesa the Dilla. And um, I thought, what else could you name an armadillo in Texas? Uh, she came in all dusty and uh, we, we cleaned her up for her beauty shot here. So this is Danielle. It kind of goes back to well, what, is she, what is she thinking? And, and I think that, that's more like, what are you thinking? Uh, what, what characteristics and traits do you apply uh, when you see this portrait of Danielle? I think she's thinking to me, like, really, one more shot. That's every photographer's famous last words. One more shot. So this, so the Bengal tiger ended up being the cover for my first book, The Animal Kingdom, uh, which was published in 2008. And um, here's a couple shots of that. And in 2008, I'm sorry, I said 2008, 2018, excuse me. So in the fall of 2018, after I did a bunch of publicity for the book, um, the publisher, uh, and I was exhausted from the publicity and we did a bunch of gallery shows all over the country and um, it was quite a tour, but the publisher said, hey, hey we're ready for your, ne your next book idea. And I thought to myself like, oh boy, like I, I don't know if I've got this in, in me anytime soon to do another book. And um, because I, I say that not because I don't love doing books, but books are sort of a, a, it's a great PR and marketing tool for photographers. It's not necessarily, excuse me, it's not necessarily a, um, uh, a tool to pay the bills, if you know what I mean. So uh, that's where more of the fine art aspects come in. So, but I, so I thought to myself, okay, what, what type of book could I do that I could photograph a little bit faster than the animal kingdom? Because the animal kingdom took, um, the, the bulk of, of three to five years um, and some falling into the neighborhood of like 10 years um, before the publishing of that. But I had to shoot this book, this next book in a year. So I thought, well, what about man's best friend, dogs? And so I, I went to the publisher and I said, let's do a book on dogs. And they loved the idea. Um, and, and so that began uh, a year long process photographing uh, over 150 different dogs for my next book called Good Dog. And here's a little kind of teaser for the book and then I'm gonna show you some pictures from the book. So that was a teaser that I put out when I was starting the process to get interest, to get other dogs that would, might be interested. Um, 
but I did feel like it was very important that I photograph a wolf um, since dogs evolved from wolves. The, the ones that hung around people are the ones that survived, so it seems, um, or so it's believed. Um, and I'm gonna read a little excerpt from my intro to this book uh, regarding wolves. It is believed that perhaps humans are in fact not responsible for the domestication of wolves at all, but that instead wolves domesticated themselves to be near to us. It is said that if, you're, if your friends are the family you choose, then dogs are the family that choose you. And choose us, it seems they did. How beautiful to know that the very things we marvel at most in our pets, loyalty, love, steadfastness, 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 excuse me, are the very things that evolved to allow us to have them in the first place. That it may all come down to a moment when the wild wolf decided to become the good dog. So then on to a more humorous portrait or a more uh, visually interesting portrait. Um, I tried to capture a range of dogs throughout this book and it was just a wonderful experience. This bloodhound had these amazing folds and amazing detail. And a lot of times people ask me when I photographed the animal kingdom, they said, did you, did you develop a greater appreciation for uh, animals when photographing that book? And I said, yeah, of course, I, for sure I did. Um, but compared to the appreciation that I've developed for dogs, um, my, it pales in comparison. I have seen um, so many of these dogs and how they are so intertwined in our daily lives um, and such a part of us uh, from a companionship perspective, from a therapeutic perspective, uh, from a service perspective. And it is, um, it is just amazing to see um, how intertwined we are with these, uh, these, these great furry companions that we have. And I tried to capture, uh, hopefully, a glimpse of that in my portraiture for this book called Good Dog. So on a, on, to, to, to go away from that serious note, there are some fun dogs in the book, some funny dogs in the book. And this is Pa Parazzi. Um, this dog came straight out of Orange County with her, uh, oh, excuse me, his uh, nails uh, done up and uh, with, his, with his pink puffy coat. This is, this is Frank, um, who was, had this just great texture and this great face and lots of layers of color. A lot of these, um, uh, I worked um, with uh, a fantastic writer to help us kind of flush out some of the captions for each animal to further humanize them and give them, show their personality. And, and I'm going to read you this one here for Slidell. Give them hell, Slidell, or at least make you think you're going to. We all know that beneath that tough exterior of the furrowed brow and frown, you're really just one big softy. Throughout this project, I found myself thinking a lot about the contrast between how a dog looks and how a dog loves. I've discovered time and time again, working with animals, that it mirrors that of humans. I wonder how different our world would be if we fought to see beneath the tough exteriors of one another and rather than backing away, decided to press in. So on the left here is uh, another toy poodle that was done up. This is, poodles are kind of a way of, uh, that some folks like to creatively express themselves. And, uh, but nonetheless, they are still loving, fun companions. And then uh, Riley with his great snaggle teeth and, and gray hair on the right, I felt like was a good juxtaposition. This is Darwin. Uh, Darwin is a mix of an Australian uh, an, an Australian Shepherd, uh, a Husky, and a standard poodle. And it was quite interesting uh, seeing his different colors and textures. And I, I, I kind of wrote, um, I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up, so I appreciate everyone uh, joining me that's still, that's still here. I, I wrote a little statement for this year as far as kind of an objective for this book and why, you know, for a lot of people, releasing a book this year is not is not good timing, but I actually think it's, it's good timing. Um, and here's why. Dogs have been in, in our lives for millennia as our best friends and our family. 
As we attempt to navigate the ever-changing terrain of a global pandemic, one thing remains constant, our dogs by our side. If there were ever a time to pay tribute to our closest companions, it is now. Good Dog is a heartwarming collection of meaningful moments with man's best friend. As we look into the eyes of these animals, may we recognize the unwavering presence of their gentle spirit, one of wisdom, unending loyalty, and perfect love for imperfect humans. And this is the cover of Good Dog. And I wanted to do something that felt similar to the tiger that was on the cover of the Animal Kingdom. This is Giddy the Australian Shepherd. And this shows you some of the uh, interiors of the book. Here was a kind of an interesting layout. <clears throat> on the left is a chow, and then on the right was a, uh, a dog called a orzoi, I believe. And then different changing its perspectives. I felt like this was a pretty cool image seeing front and back of Mia. Mia was a, um, a service dog that was trained to notice the next, and, uh, Mia was trained to notice an escalation of heart rate in her dog's, I mean, sorry, in her owner's heart. And when, when Mia noticed that escalation of heart rate, um, she would come to her side to comfort her. And then this is showing the two books together. And uh, the publisher and I, we wanted to create books of the same size with the same background. So it sort of feels like this library of uh, uh, of, of, of a collection that you could purchase even together. So um, I do want to end this with hopefully something fun because I, I have a, uh, we talk about these loyal companions. My companion has been sitting next to me uh, this whole time. And so I want to uh, give you some tips on how to photograph your dog. Um, so the, the, the first, I'm going to go through this and then I'll, I'll go over to video mode where you can uh, see me full screen. Um, the first, and some people are going to check out here, train your dog to sit and stay in the most distracting circumstances. I've told people that want, that want me to photograph their dog in studio, if your dog can sit and stay at the busiest terminal in the busiest airport on the busiest travel of day of the year, if your dog can sit and stay in that circumstance, then I can photograph your dog in a studio, no problem. But if not, it's going to be challenging. So you're not going to be photographing your dog in a studio necessarily, but you do need to train your dog to sit and stay in the most distracting of circumstances. The next is to use a treat uh, for your dog to follow, which will help with direct, uh, kind of help direct his or her eyes to the camera. Um, and now I'm going to go I'm just gonna hop off here. Um, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. I'm gonna show you guys how we do this. Oh, before I do that, when you're photographing your dog, um, try to photograph your dog outdoors in soft, natural light, like in the shade or towards the end of the day. You don't wanna photograph your dog in the middle of the day or inside with you know bright lights shining down on him. You want either window light or that soft end of the day light. And then finally, you want to get on your dog's eye level. You don't want to shoot down at him. Um, that doesn't create as interesting of a shot. So I'm going to stop this share. Let's see here. Give me a second. Okay. All right, so I am going to I'm gonna rotate my screen over this way. You can see Rosie, my labradoodle right here. She's clearly ready to work. Uh, and then let me, let me close these windows, or at least so we're not so backlit. Are you ready to work, Rosie? All right, let me flip, flip the lights on. All right, guys. First thing you want to do, Rosie, sit up, sit up. So make sure you've got some treats on hand. Make sure she knows what you got. You like that? Okay. Now she's been laying down for quite some time, so she might not be as amenable to this, but let's just see. All right, Rosie, Rosie, hop up, hop up, hop up, up. Here, you got to perform for me. We got a bunch of people watching. All right, sit, sit. 
Okay, wait, wait. So I use the, the command wait. Some people use the, the uh, command uh, hold or stay or whatever you wanna do. So I'm, I'm gonna go in like this and I'm gonna show her what I've got, okay? Watch Rosie, watch. And so she knows what I've got and you see she's watching this treat. And so if you're here and if you've got a friend uh, that, or a partner that can help you with this, then that would be great. So you could have one person holding the treat for the dog to watch and then another to take the picture. So I'm down on her eye level and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what's called pay her. There you go, Rosie. There you go. Good girl. All right, Rosie, watch, watch. So you can see how I'm directing her. This is what we do in the studio. We'll direct her eye line, line of sight so she can actually see um, or so we can actually kind of get her eyes in the right spot. Good girl. And then I'm gonna show you guys one more thing. In the studio, a lot of times what we'll do, I'm work, if I'm working with a trainer, you got one of these things. It's kind of like a, uh, sort of like a long dowel rod that can compress. But I think you can get these on Amazon. They're called Brandon McMillan uh, training devices. So you, when you're using something like this, and then I'm, I'm the photographer down here, you can really get them up. So Rosie, up, up here. Make sure she knows what you got. So Rosie, up. Come on. <laughs> Come on, get up. Okay. All right. So you know, she knows what I got. But she knows there's something good on there. And then, and then she can watch that. So see, I'm going to bring it over to the, to the monitor, and she'll watch the monitor, sort of. Come back over here, Rosie. Good girl. Good girl. All right. See if you can get that off there. All right, guys. I hope that was kind of a fun way to end this. Um, and I am, I haven't gotten any um, text from uh, the team at Sparrow, but um, if you guys have any questions later, uh, don't hesitate to ask. My book will be coming out um, uh, on September 22nd and uh, it's called Good Dog and The Animal Kingdom is also available right now. So we have no questions yet, but we have a recommendation for your third book to be on <laughs> the path. So oh. that's out for you. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll tell you this. There's a, cats are very challenging to photograph in this studio environment. And um, I, I did, there, there's, there's a little surprise at the end of the dog book. And uh, it's, a, it's a portrait of a cat. And on top of the portrait, it says, you didn't think I wouldn't have the last word, did you? So that's, as of now, that's as far as it's going to go. But who knows? Maybe I'll do a book on cats one day. I love that. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, your career is amazing. And I'm sure that all no, of thank you are just as blown away as we were. So we really appreciate it. And to everyone watching, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be raffling off um, signed copies of Randall's The Animal Kingdom book. So all you have to do to enter is comment your name. And if you're a resident of one of our properties, please let us know in the comments. And the winner will be announced on Friday. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And again, Randall, thank you so much. We really enjoyed having you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.